Welcome to The View from the Top with Brian Friedman, brought to you by Benevo. We offer digital products for top companies to help their employees relocate and settle into a new city. In this series, you'll hear stories, advice, insights, and thoughts on the future from leaders in HR and the talent mobility profession. As a listener, you also get a fantastic deal. That's 20 registrations, free of charge, worth £10,000 when you launch with our starter plan. To claim, go to benevo.com and enter the code PODCAST2018 in the special offer field on our contact page. Hello and welcome to today's edition of the View from the Top podcast brought to you by Benevo. My name is Brian Friedman and I'm the Strategy Director of Benevo, the world's leading welcome as a service mobility tech company. So what is the view from the top? It's exciting, it's innovative, it's fun. It's just a little something that's our way of giving back to the community. What it is, it's your chance to hear from some of the most well-respected and experienced professionals in the HR and talent mobility industry. And over the next few weeks, I'm going to be interviewing some of the most influential movers and shakers in our profession so that you can hear from them how did they get to the top? Who influenced them along the way? What life lessons have they learned? And perhaps most importantly, what issues and challenges do they see coming down the turnpike? And I'm delighted to say that our guest today is Eric Halverson. Now, Eric is, I think it's fair to say, without undue flattery, Eric is something of a legend in the global mobility world in Silicon Valley. He started work way back in 1975 as a high school teacher, but moved into the expatriate world back in 1987. And he's held jobs in those early days at various accounting firms, including Deloitte, PwC, and KPMG. But Eric is probably best known as being one of the founding fathers of the Bay Area global mobility community, having joined eBay as the head of global mobility some 15 years ago in 2003. Now, as I'm sure listeners will appreciate, in tech terms, 2003 must have been positively anti-diluvian compared to what eBay is like today. And we'll get Eric to talk more about it, but I'm guessing that eBay today is radically different to the company that he joined back in 2003. So Eric, welcome to The View from the Top. I know our listeners are going to be fascinated to hear your perspective, sitting as you do in the very heart of the tech revolution. Eric, welcome to The View from the Top. Uh, thank you, Brian. appreciate you having me. And uh, uh, again, thanks for including me in this series. Um, absolutely. The, you know, be, being in the Silicon Valley and watching it explode from the early uh, dot-com bubble till now has, has been a, a, a wild ride, and it's been a, a fun ride to be a, a part of. You can, you can believe that. Well, tell us a little bit about the eBay you joined and the sorts of changes and things that have happened uh, to eBay as a company. Uh, both in terms of its tech and its reach and people's familiarity with it and over the last ooh, 15 years that you've been there? Sure. Well, I started working with eBay uh, actually as a supplier. So I was, I was doing taxes. I was an international tax guy with KPMG and uh, eBay became my client. And it was a very tiny little client. Uh, it uh, just had a little bit of international presence at that time. It was primarily a U.S. Uh, online uh, commerce that people were beginning to discover. Um, but Back then, uh, were people really doing... nervy about using eBay? The sort of, you know, how did it work sort of thing? Was, was it you know, a bit of a new concept? <laughs> yeah, it was new. Well, you remember George Bush calling it the internet. Um, a, lot, a lot of people weren't sure about you know, buying online or what that was like or could it be trusted. Um, the, you know, it, it was sort of the Wild West. Uh, Things were, were, you know, just starting up and, and people were getting used to actually doing things on computers, um, especially commerce. 
And so, you know, it was very exciting from that standpoint. And, uh, you know, as I said, you know, internationally, things had, had not really uh, blossomed at eBay yet. They, they, we had a, a small business in, in the UK and one in Germany that, that was starting up. And, uh, you know, back in mobility terms, we only had, uh, you know, just a, a handful of people that had done international transfers or had been on international assignments. And, uh, you know, so it was, it was principally, you know, a domestic, we, we, you know, we were hiring, but, you know, we, uh, you know, ba back then we were around 3000 employees, which, you know, seemed really big to us at that time, because we were functioning really down here in San Jose as, as a startup, uh, we, a little bit more than a startup, because, you know, we went public like 1999, but uh, uh, it still had that startup feel, very, very much the startup feel. Uh, people wore, you know, uh, different hats. <laughs> um, you know, it was one of those things where uh, if you, you know, if there was a need, you did it. Um, there wasn't, you and know, real founders, um, siloed still, services. Yeah, and the founders were still walking the corridors, and in those days. And... It, it, exactly right. You know, and you, you'd walk the corridors. You'd, you'd see Pierre, you know, the founder. Or you, you know, you see Meg, uh, the CEO, and. Uh, you know, it was all, everything seemed, you know, very, very flat, uh, you know, with regards to the leadership structure. Um, everybody had that startup feel where, you know, um, I remember when I first, when I first came here, um, like I say, I, I, I came here um, essentially to start the mobility team. Uh, there, there wasn't a mobility program per se. They had administrative assistants trying to figure out how to do mobility. And so you would imagine, design the yeah. policies and the programs. Exactly. So, so I was actually morphing from a, a tax person uh, into more of a generalist HR mobility person, even while at KPMG, because I had a, a portfolio of, of you know small clients. Like I say, eBay at that point was, from a mobility standpoint, was just a small client, a uh, handful of of people, but. Uh, they all had the same needs. They all needed to understand the policies. They all needed to understand how things worked. Uh, you had immigration issues. You had relocation issues. You had tax issues. And uh, I was sort of learning as we went. I was coming from a strong tax background, but it was uh, having to interact with all these small companies uh, that actually was teaching me immigration and relocation at the same time. I, I always say when I'm chatting to relocation professionals that, if you have to liken relocation to an Olympic sport, then the sport that we're in is the decathlon, that you have to have all these different skills, uh, whether it's sprinting or javelin or pole vault, you have to have all these different skills. But actually, any, any leading decathlete, they always seem to have a core skill, which is the one they started with. Nobody actually went in to say, I'm going to be a decathlete. They say, I went, you know, I trained as a, a sprinter or a pole vaulter. And I think it's the same way in our industry, that people get end up at the same place. But some come at it through reward or tax or relocation or immigration. So you come at it through through the tax route, which indeed yeah, I have too. Exactly right. I think it's a great metaphor. Um, because like you say, nobody went to school and majored in mobility. Um, but you end up with a with a with a skill of sorts, and, and then and then life and circumstances and choices lead you down the road, and before you know it, you're you're in a mobility function. Um, like they, you know, I came out from a tax background, a corporate tax background, uh, as a CPA and uh, masters in tax, and was doing international corporate. I also was doing individual tax returns, and then uh, international individual tax returns, and boom, before you know it, you're you're working with people that are moving from country to country. And uh, that was my entrance into into the world of global mobility was, you know, helping uh, employees that were transferring or on assignment with their taxes and then working with the companies. And, of course, you know, then they wanted to know, well, you know, if you do that, well, well what should we do about this? What should we do about payroll? What should we do about uh, our policy? What should we do about, and before you know it, you're researching for them and learning and working with them. And before you know it, like you say, you're in the capitalist and you didn't even know it. And what do you see about the differences between working uh, supplier side, in your case with you know KPMG or one of the other firms there, and working corporate side? How do you see the, the differences in terms of the way you work and your, I, I don't know, your, 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 your working life? 
You know, that's a great question because on the supplier side, you're always looking to please. You're always looking to um, uh, uh, find out, you know, what, what, what they need and then make, make the right suggestion and not push too hard and, and, uh, but, but try to guide. And, uh, and then once you get on the inside, um, what, what I found, and it, it took me a little while to adapt to this, was they weren't looking for advice. They were, look, were looking for someone to tell them what to do. They were looking for someone that had the answers, and we just tell them what to do. And so sometimes coming from a consulting perspective was a bit of a weakness uh, for me because, uh, you know, you, you have this tendency to want to say, well, you could do this, or you could do this, or you could do this. What do you think you'd like to do? And, and, and that was not the advice they wanted. They wanted you to do all the analysis. They wanted you to make a decision and then tell them what they needed to do so they could move forward. And that, that was a bit of a that, – that brought me up short a couple of times. Yeah, I must admit, um, I remember having a plant once in my early in my career. I must say it's the only time I've ever lost my temper with a client um, because I had this client that couldn't work out what they wanted to do. And they were looking at one solution and another solution and the first solution again, the second solution. And each time they kept asking me, well, can you do a bit more analysis on solution A? Can you do a bit more analysis on solution B? And this was going on and I was racking up great fees. So from a, a, a supplier point of view, it was great. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, but, your billable hours were great. But it, exactly. But it was frustrating. And in the end, I, I, I said, it's the only time I've ever lost my client, my temper with a client. I said to the client, look, to be honest, I don't care what you do. Just, and I use an F word, just do something. And the yeah. client came back to me often and said that was actually the best piece of advice they'd ever had. <laughs> you know, yep. just do something, you know, one or the other, and make it work. Uh, That's exactly right, because when I was a supplier, I, in the same situation, Brian, they were, they were always looking for me to tell them what to do. But as you know, as a tax person, as a CPA, you're precluded. You're not allowed to make management decisions. You yeah. can't tell them what to do, even if it's staring them right in the face. Um, and so, you know, once I was on the inside, then, then what I found, uh, you know, again, on, on the inside, frequently what you find is, is, you know, sometimes there's an environment of confusion, sometimes an environment of fear, sometimes people just, you know, aren't sure if they've got the authority to make decisions. So when I came into eBay, I think, I think one of my great strengths and uh, what I hope to pass on to the rest of my team is we make decisions. We're not afraid to make decisions. We'll make the decisions so we can move the ball down the field. If we make a mistake, we'll own up to the mistake. But, but making a decision and moving forward is, is way better than sitting with uh, analysis paralysis. Yeah, absolutely. And once you've made the decision, somehow you end up making it work nine times out of ten. It's, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, tell me a little bit about um, your role today. So tell me a bit about, I don't know, the number of moves you do in a year, the types of move, long-term, short-term travelers, your, the sorts of uh, things that are, you know, that are on your agenda, the, sorts of, the, the size of your team. Just a little bit about the mobility function as it sits at, at, at eBay. Well, as we as we said today, um, like I say, we're, we're we're sort of um, half the company we were uh, three years ago uh, when we spun PayPal off. So back back in our uh, joint PayPal eBay days, we were doing about 2,000 moves a year. Um, so we're down to about 1,000 moves a year now that we've spun PayPal off. It was about a 50-50 deal. So we do about 1,000 moves a year. Um, uh, it's it, it it will vary. Usually it's 40-60 either domestic or international, and that, that'll go back and forth. One year we'll be doing 60% international, the next year we'll be doing 60% domestic. Um, we, we have a pretty steady, stable inventory of uh, what we call long-term uh, temporary assignments internationally, you know, your typical long-term expat assignment uh, of between 40 to 60. Um, we lean heavily towards uh, what we call indefinite transfers internationally. So we'd rather we'd rather move somebody and put them on a local payroll as opposed to maintain them on host payroll. Um, but there are certain circumstances where host uh, or home payroll makes the most sense. So, like I say, long-term assignments, 40 to 60. Uh, you know, anywhere between you know uh, 200 to you know 400 
international moves of other types, uh, short-term business trips, uh, yeah, um, uh, indefinite transfers, commuters, rotations. Um, and then on the domestic side, we um, obviously are, are moving people uh, within the United States. We're headquartered in San Jose and have you know big uh, offices in Austin and Salt Lake City, uh, some, uh, New York. And so we're moving uh, people within the U.S. And like most programs, we're, we're seeing a shift now from uh, a fully managed move to uh, an emphasis on uh, lump sum moves. I, I'd say we're about 50-50 with regards to uh, the split there. So it's a, it's a pretty robust program. We see a little bit of everything. And do you think the trend is going that way, more lump sum moves, less sort of, uh, I don't want to call them full fat assignments? Well, I, I see that happening. I see that, I see that happening with the, uh, as a result of the, the type of employee we're moving, you know, the, the younger folks. Um, you know, in the old days, everybody wanted to move, um, you know, they, they had grandma's china and grandma's furniture. Everybody was holding on to things, and so you're always moving everything. And uh, if, if, a, if a lighter, more nimble employee base that we find we have now, especially uh, in the Silicon Valley. And, yeah, uh, gen generation, take, generation take much. Cycles, I call them. Yeah, exactly right. Yeah. And uh, so, you know, we, we, we readjust and, and, and see. Our, you know, our lump sum program is not a, a typical buyout. It's not like we give, give them, you know, the amount of money that a fully managed move would, would have taken. Uh, we still like to move people if they actually need to be moved. But a lot, a lot of people would, you know, like I say, don't have the don't have the need. As a matter of fact, we've seen our we, we've seen even our fully managed move uh, weights, uh, you know, drop. Uh, our average weight drops significantly, uh, you know, to, to one third of what it used to be uh, three years ago. So what do you mean by weight? Uh, you, you, your, your transit weight, so uh, uh, on the van lines, yeah. right? So yeah. we used to have, you know, 7,000 pounds uh, average, say, that you were moving, and now it's down to 2,000 pounds. Okay, so they're not taking their stuff with them. And um, what are they doing? Are they tending to put that stuff in storage, or do they just tend to sell it on eBay before they go? Well, well I like to think they're selling it on eBay. And we want to encourage them to do that, but uh, I think I think a lot of them just sell it um, uh, or or donate it. There's services you know to donate it or they, or they you know give it away. Or or what's interesting is, is again because a lot of people you know are uh, younger, uh, they just haven't accumulated it in the first place. Yeah. So what sort of age is your typical mover movie? Oh, probably uh, probably early thirties. Late twenties, early thirties. So you know, we, we sort of have two tiers of, schooling of groups. Schooling is an issue when they move. Then it's they tend to be single or young marrieds, maybe, and not so much young kids, but not kids at high school and like that. Yeah, well, come you know for the, the the tech group, you know, you're you're getting mature people who are typically are getting some kind of advanced degree from from the universities. So so they're coming out, you know, in their late twenties as opposed to their early twenties. And uh, you know, um, so if they're coming out of the out of the universities, they're typically in their late twenties. If you're, you're hiring them from a other, uh, maybe this is their second their second uh, employment or third employment, so early thirties. And then of course you've got your more mature leadership group that you're moving. And in that instance, you're probably looking at you know uh, late thirties, early forties. And, and then there's a few dinosaurs like me every once in a while that you move around. <laughs> Oh, I'm sure you're not a dinosaur. Um, anyway, just sort of moving on to sort of, if you like, your, your early days, you must have met some pretty inspirational people working, you know, especially, you know, in the early days at, at eBay where you had a, you know, a fairly radical new company and concept. I appreciate it wasn't wholly new when you started it, but even so, you know, there are some pretty uh, forward-thinking people out there who have changed, I think it's, you know, it's no understatement to say they have, have actually changed the world. Um, so who have you met? You don't necessarily have to name names, but who have you met that has really inspired you in your career? And perhaps even more importantly, how did they inspire you? What, what did they, what were the lessons you learned from, from the people you've met along the way? Um, that's a great question. Um, I, I, I honestly was, was pretty inspired by Pierre uh, Omidyar. 
who was our founder and chairman of the board, and Meg Whitman, who was our CEO when I got to, to uh, eBay. And uh, I really liked, and, and really the reason I've been able to, to, to stay so long at eBay um, is I really liked the culture and the, and the perspective on life that they were able to uh, embed within the, within the business here. Um, did, a, did a really good grasp on, uh, on making the world better, doing something that had significance, not just making money, not just creating a widget, but, but how do you actually, uh, how do you actually impact the world? And, you, you know, can you go to work feeling that, you know, what you're doing matters? And in, in the case of eBay, you know, uh, we were creating commerce that allowed uh, uh, stay-at-home mothers uh, to, 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 you know, make a living, to people who are, uh, you know, invalid to make a living, uh, people who are in, uh, you know, poor areas or, uh, you know, to, to make a living. And so uh, we've got some, you know, some very inspiring type of, you know, seller uh, stories. And really, I, I would look, you know, um, I, I know maybe the answer you're looking for is, you know, you know, the head of the head of Oracle or the, the head of Google or something like that. But really, I think it, it, for me, it was the, the grassroots inspiration of uh, people that uh, uh, were pulling themselves up from uh, their bootstraps and taking the, you know, eBay uh, and the platform and uh, doing what uh, doing what they previously they hadn't been able to do. Having said that, it you know is inspiring to to just watch. Maybe not an individual, but watch what happened to the Silicon Valley. I mean, you know, when when I got here at eBay, uh, Google was just sort of starting up as well. Um, uh, Apple and, and, was, and, and was. Are you Silicon Valley born and bred? I'm a, I'm a, no, I'm not. I'm, I'm actually born uh, in Toronto, Canada. So I'm a, I'm an immigrant from Canada, in Canada at an early age, and then raised in uh, California. So I'm uh, you know you, you don't have to scratch too. You know, I'm, I'm basically California, but I've been raised in the in, in the San Francisco Bay Area, you know, the majority of my life. Um, so you so you've seen San Jose go from uh, I won't say a sleepy town, but to go from uh, not orchard of named town, yep. yeah, that it that it is. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Absolutely, I've seen it go from orchards and ranches to to the town that it is now. When I was starting my accounting career, Brian. Uh, you know, they, they were begging people to come to San Jose uh, to work uh, in all these new little businesses that were starting up. And, uh, y you know, um, everybody, you know, scoffed at it because obviously San Francisco was the hub. San Francisco was where everybody, you know, wanted to work and make their career. And San Jose was like this little backwater, you know, one, you know, you know, why would you go there and ruin your career? Yeah. And do you even know the way there is? <laughs> exactly right. Um, and I could I could kick myself from not coming here earlier. Trust me, because I was one of those uh, arrogant little uh, accountants that thought he was going to make his way in the world, you know, in the world of finance in San Francisco. And meanwhile, you had all the geniuses down here in San in San Jose changing the world. Now, I want to go back to to Pierre and just uh, and indeed even you coming from Canada, but. But Pierre, one of the statistics I read, and I can't remember precisely the hand, but it's something like over 50% of all companies, that, all Silicon Valley companies that are now valued at over a billion, were started by immigrants, uh, or maybe it includes the children of immigrants. But, you know, but there's this big thing about, uh, about people who have come from outside being the ones who are really adding the value. And I know that doesn't chime that well when you get politicians trying to restrict uh, immigration. I don't particularly want to go into the political side of this, but why do you think it is, and you've obviously seen it firsthand with many of the people in, in the valley, why do you think it is that uh, the people are, who are, I'll use expats in, 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 in the broader sense, but people who are themselves mobile, who have moved into the area, are the ones who are, who are really creating these companies? Um, you know, I, I, I'm not exactly I'm not exactly sure. Other than um, like like if you look at Silicon Valley, I mean it, it is truly an international area. I mean it's you know it, it's just a, a melting pot of ideas and, and cultures and and different different people. Um, you know we are we are hiring out of uh, 
you know, American universities. So the question is, you know, why are all these cultures coming to American universities and why are they the ones that are being, uh, you know, taking the classes and, and, the, and the area of study, um, you know, that, that has fueled the Silicon Valley? I, I, I think uh, a couple of things. One, one is, in order to in order to, to get to America and into an American institution, um, you just have to the, the cream just rises to the the top. I have a, 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 an Indian friend who explained to me she's an engineer of, of just you know how many just just the sheer numbers and volume of people uh, trying to get into the universities you know in in India and how competitive it is. So that you've already you know screened out, you know, sort of the, the, the ones who don't want to work that hard, for example, and you've got the, the cream coming to the top. And then even so, those then applying and, and getting a position here in the U.S. Is, so you're getting the best of the best from all around the world coming to the, U, the universities here. And then they come, and a lot of times, you know, they, they come from cultures where they didn't have perhaps the, the, the freedom of thought or the freedom uh, ability to do whatever you want to do. And, and here in Silicon Valley, especially with the venture capital guys and folks looking for, for new ideas and willing to fund and, and you know, take a, take a bet, you know, you, you got to admit, uh, the American economy is um, unique in one sense in that we've always been willing to uh, take a bet on a new idea. And I, I, don't, think, uh, I don't think that's truer than uh, here in Silicon Valley. If you've, if you've got a gift and you've got an idea and you're willing to work hard, uh, you'll find someone willing to, uh, to back you and uh, you've got a real shot at success. Okay, well let's just talk then, let's just carry on that conversation a little bit about um, the people starting off. I mean, you talked about people at, at, at school and at grad school in, um, who come from overseas. But let's just talk about people coming into uh, into the workforce today, and in particular, I suppose those people coming into our profession. What lessons would you pass on to those people who are who are coming in? You know, so if you were meeting someone, maybe you know, the young Eric Halverson, you know, you were meeting your younger self, you were meeting someone who's say in their mid twenties who's starting in mobility. What lessons would you pass on to, on to them? Well, one of them is is um, don't take the shortcut and take the time to actually learn what other people do. Um, and by that, I mean I, I see a lot of mobility people that want to be managers of outsourced providers, but they don't really take the time to learn what the outsourced providers do or how their businesses function or what the friction points are, where the revenue streams are. And um, I think I, I think the one thing I'm, I'm I'm glad that I did one because because I didn't know much when I started I knew tax but didn't know much uh, of relocation or immigration I had to learn it as I go as I went um, I think I, I think I benefited greatly by talking to all these other subject matter experts the the suppliers and and learning about their business learn, learning how they did and do what they do as opposed to just kind of being above it as the client and, and, and the manager. And kind of so, so you're saying don't outsource something you don't understand, because if you do, yeah, you'll, that, you'll lose control. Of it. That, that's a much more efficient way of saying what I tried to uh, mumble there. Yeah, thank you, Brian. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, good. Um, what but, other uh, things would you, would you pass on to people starting today? Um, you know, I, I've always tried to live by the golden rule, um, you know, to treat others the way I want to be treated. I think uh, you can't divorce your business life from your, from your core principles and your core ethics. Um, I think, you know, when I first started at eBay, one of our, one of our core principles here at eBay was that, you know, people are basically good and, um, you know, it's okay to trust people. And, and I, I think that's, you know, uh, one of the things I, I maintain as well. I think, I think most people are nice. Most people want to do well. Most people want to be fair. Most people want to do the right thing. And so when there's friction or conflict, um, you know, if you kind of have that as a base and, and use that as the base for resolving the conflict, it, it works out a lot more time 
than uh, adversarial or uh, bullying or you know other other ways of doing business. So I've been very fortunate in that. You know, I I you know I, I know I'm opinionated. I know that you know I make decisions. Uh, you know, right or wrong, I make them. I know there have been times people have uh, disagreed with me, but I think fortunately for most of my career, um, I've always been able to walk away from a meeting and knowing that uh, you know um, people have felt like they've been uh, treated with respect and dignity and fairly. I've had uh, you know suppliers that you know have not had a chance uh, maybe to work with us still tell me they thought that uh, they were treated fairly and that that's important to me. You, you've mentioned suppliers and let's just spend a few moments talking about them. There obviously are you know many many companies that want to work with eBay and obviously many are disappointed that they can't and obviously there's a limit who you can work to. But what tips would you give to a supplier that wants to work with you and, and your team? What, in your view, makes a good supplier, makes a good vendor? Um, well, there, there's, there's two things. What makes a good vendor that you're working with currently or what makes a good vendor that wants to work with you and is trying to get in in, uh, in with you? Um, maybe, maybe a little bit two different angles. You know, the, the one that is working with you um, is, is there just has to be that level of trust. There has to be that, that real-time trusted communication and uh, uh, so that you know what's going on and so that you can trust what's going on. The, thing, the reason I, I think I, I, I focus so much on suppliers, Brian, is that here at eBay, we really have an outsourced um, uh, program. We've not attempted to build an internal global mobility department that does things themselves. So Rather, how, we how, how, how big is your team? Our, our team is, we have four, four people. Okay, and you're managing about a thousand moves. Yeah. That's, that's, yeah, 250 each. That's, that's, more than one, that's more than one a day during the working week. You know, so, so we, you know, we, you know I've, I've got a team that, uh, I have an individual that sort of comes from a, as you were talking with the, uh, your metaphor on the, the decathlon, um, the one who's, who comes from a strength of uh, mobility or relocation, one that comes from a strength of immigration, one that comes from a strength of tax. And then there's me that kind of, you know, oversees it all. And we all do everything. We, we've cross trained so everybody can do everything. But obviously, there's a core strength that each one of us has. Okay. And so we talked a bit about the vendors that you work with currently. Um, I'm saying that's about trust. What about the ones that want to work with you? Um, I, I think I think the ones that want to work with me have to be patient. They, they have to understand that uh, you know di different people will, will run their programs differently. But here at eBay, you know, we we value loyalty, and so we don't just change to make a change. You know, it's not like a dating game. Um, you know, we're not you know looking just to be entertained. Um, so we're looking for people that are going to bring value with uh, you know new ideas and really provide. If we're going to make a change, there, there's two ways to do it. One, one we, can, we can make a change by, by switching out one supplier for another. The other one is that we can add a supplier to, to, to the supply chain. And so, you know, the, the key is what's the compelling reason? What, you know, what, especially if we're looking to make a change, you know, you have to provide me a compelling reason to, to make a change because change is, is expensive in terms of money and time and effort. Um, so, you know, we're not just going to be uh, we're not just going to, you know, get rid of one of our suppliers because a mistake was made or, you know, um, some, some little thing. Uh, but we're also willing to, to, to add to the supply chain uh, within uh, reasonable bounds if, you know, someone's bringing something new. And that's, that's uh, especially in, in today's environment, especially in Silicon Valley, what we try to keep our eye on. So I'm, we've, uh, we've kept an open door pretty much to be willing to speak to people to, to one, stay stay tuned into you know what's going on in the industry so that we're not falling behind because trust me we've never felt like we've got on top of this thing things change so quickly um, but what's the new idea how are you doing things differently you know you know ex, ex, teach us something okay okay so we've talked a little bit about where you are at the moment indeed we also talked a little bit about where you and where eBay came from let's start looking at the future. Um, and I'll start with the near future, if I may. Let's take the next 12 months, or maybe I'll be generous and give you um, 18 months. 
What are your top three objectives for that, that near term future? What's on you know, top of the in, inbox? Well, you know, I, I may be a little bit unique in this instance, but Brian, because I, I plan on retiring within the next 18 months. So my, my, my focus. The succession is up there. <laughs> it is succession, exactly right. And, uh, you know, my, my team, my, my, my number one priority is to try to, to pass on, um, hopefully, hopefully whatever I've learned that's good uh, to the team that I have and to um, teach them as much as I can uh, as to, you know, how things work. Um, so, you know, like I say, I've got, got, gotten, a, you know, a, a colleague who is really strong in immigration. Well, I want her to, to understand you know, the tax world and, and why we do certain things in the tax world and why do we work, work it a certain way and wh why do we choose these, these suppliers and, you know, what relationship we have. So I want to pass on the knowledge. I want to pass on the relationships and hopefully kind of pass on sort of the, the spirit with which we, we do our business as well. Um, having said that, number one, so succession is number one. Two is we're in the midst of doing sort of a, a review of our whole program. Like I say, knowing that my departure is imminent, I said, okay, well, one way for us to, to cross train is let's look at everything we're doing and say, is there a better way to do this? So we're actually going to look at, 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 at all our relationships, all the way we're doing business as, as much as we can, you know, while we still you know, get our day-to-day -day and, and evaluate and say, okay, this is the way we've done it. Is it does this still make sense? Is this, is this still the best way to do it? And so we're going to do a, a whole program review. And um, quite honestly, I think that's a, a, a big bite of the apple. So th those are the, I know you said three, but those, those are really the two things that I'm focused on. Okay. And if we go forward now for the next five or 10 years, so this is going to be a, the post Eric world, uh, where do you, what do you think are going to be the biggest changes that our industry is going to see? So, you know, if you came back in 10 years time, what do you think would be different compared to what it's like today? And I guess you guys sitting in the heart of Silicon Valley are probably more attuned to, you know, the radical developments that are coming down the turnpike yeah. than, than many people. Well, you know, I, I've talked to a lot of, a lot of friends in, in, in you know, in the industry about this and, you know, with, with the whole development of artificial intelligence, with the continuing surge of, of technology, I even wonder if there will be global mobility departments. Everything potentially is moving so quickly towards self-serve and, and, and the ability to do everything yourself. Um, you know, is there going to be a need for the mobility department as we, you know, as we have it now, um, you know, to what, you know, in, in what ways is technology going to take over uh, the functions that we have? I have to, I have to believe that because people are involved, there's always going to be the need for some people to people um, interaction and resolution. Um, but I think it's going to change. Uh, fairly drastically, and I think things are more and more going to be put into the hands of the employee that's relocating more and more. So I think that the, the nature of the interaction is going to change. And um, what about? I mean, you're a tax guy, um, you know, from from background. Uh, what about things like tax equalization on the balance sheet? Do you think you know somebody coming back in ten years' time would be saying, "Oh my God, that's so old-fashioned. Who does that?" Or would you think that there will always be a role for, for that sort of tax equalization balance sheet approach? You know, it's a, it's a great question. Um, you know, I don't know. I think people, I, you know, it's hard to believe that taxes will ever go away. So you always think there's going to be, you know, a tax, a tax issue with relocation. Um, you know, who knows what governments are going to do. I mean, what we see right now is, you know, it, although, you know, the world's opening up more and more, governments are closing down more and more. So you see in the area of immigration and taxation, uh, you know, sovereign nations, you know, acting more and more nationalistic. Um, but, you know, will, you know, will, will the company 
assume the responsibilities like we do now. Right now, the company assumes responsibility for, for somehow keeping you whole. Um, you know, will it do that or will it take a more, a more uh, open, uh, you know, self, uh, self-choice, you know, perspective of saying, <clears throat> you know, here's your, here's your budget. You can spend it any way you want, um, you know. You can allocate it uh, towards tax, uh, towards your taxes, or you can allocate it towards your move, or you can allocate it towards uh, whatever you want. Um, but we're going to be uninvolved in it. I, I can see it going that way. Okay. And what about? I mean, what you're saying is there might be less people working in global mobility because more is dealt with through uh, artificial intelligence and virtual reality, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And I, I can see all that. But what about the actual number of moves? I mean, there is a school of thought that says companies are going to get much more global much more quickly and therefore we're going to see way more moves of people moving across borders. There's another school of thought that says we're going to see way less moves across border because so much more is going to be done virtually and through technology. So I suppose my question to you is, again, if you look at uh, a company in 10 years time, do you think they're going to have more moves than they have now or the typical company, more moves or less moves? Boy, um, it's a good one. Again, again you know, in, in, in terms of technology, you know, we've seen a, we've seen it go both ways. We've seen, you know, we, you know, we've seen uh, like Hewlett Packard saying, you know, okay, everybody's got to be in the office, and then we see, you know, other companies that say, no, you know, work remote wherever you want to work. That's that's fine. Um, I certainly. I would say less moves. I'm just, you know, I'm just kind of thrown out there, but I'm not sure that, you know, it seems to me less moves. And, and the reason is, you know, is, it's just so costly to move people and it's so costly to have office buildings. And it seems like, you know, uh, people's preference is to work from home. I, I see, I see a move towards, you know, much more home-based activity and much less uh, uh, office activity. Now, I think there always has to be offices, or I think there's always going to need to be headquarters. There's always going to need to be a way for groups to synergize together and socialize together. But you know, the technology now, when I when, when I see what's going on with eBay and LinkedIn and other places, and uh, just you know the, the availability of you know the video conferencing, um, right now I, I would I would say I mean you know less moves. You know why why move somebody? Uh, you know, someone where where they can be online all day with the same person without moving. So it sounds like you got you got into this industry at a very good time, and I think the way you're talking is you we may be getting out at a very good time too. But <laughs> talk, talk, talking of time, I think we we are actually out of time. So what I want to do, it's been an honour and a privilege to have you uh, on our on our show today on the podcast. And Eric, Eric Halverson, I just wanted to thank you for being such a sport and taking part in the view from the top. Uh, we hope you, our listeners, have enjoyed it and you'll tune back in next week for the next of our series of podcasts. Um, but Eric, thank you very much for joining us today on the view from the top. No, thank you very much, Brian. It's been fun and I really appreciate you including me. It's a great, it's a great series. Thank you much. Okay, excellent. And, and thank you, everybody, for listening. For more episodes, you can subscribe at Benevo.com. And remember, you can also claim our special offer worth £10,000. That's 20 additional registrations free of charge with our starter plan. Simply go to Benevo.com and enter podcast 2018 in the special offer field on the contact page. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this episode of The View from the Top.